And yeah. Okay, welcome everybody uh, to this session, the 16th session, and we're looking at designing creating online learning activities and resources. And we'll just give you a couple of introductory pages here if you're new to the session. So um, the underlying element about what we want to talk about today is that online learning can make us, uh, can enable us, empower us to do things that we've always done in different ways, but to do more of them and to do them potentially more successfully. Completely new opportunities that online learning activities can give us, completely new opportunities for students. So in terms of the intro bit here, this uh, in that second panel on the screen, um, the focus is going to be very much on pedagogy today. Although we are going to talk about technology, clearly pedagogy is at the heart of it. And about this session is really just to say to you that, like Ron was saying, there's, um, we are aware of there's a lot of people. Some will be very experienced online, some less so. The most we're going to ask you to do is to have two windows open. One is the screen that Ron's sharing, and one is the screen we'll direct you to in a moment. So next slide is about us, and that's the three of us there. That's all you need to know. Um, you can come back and look at it later if you want. And the project itself, there's a whole series, and we'll have links to some of these later on. But this is the 16th of the talks. There's a whole series that are being actively turned into online journeys as part of the Future Teacher Project. It's all free, it's all um, Creative Commons, and so you can use it and adapt it as you like. So, moving swiftly on, we'd like you to open up this link. So this is learningapps.co.uk slash scary, S-C-A-R-I. That will become apparent why we've chosen that particular one in a moment. And I think you'll be able to get the link. There's the link in the text chat. It's a slightly different link. It's the longer link in the text chat. But uh, if you would like to open that up, you will then be in a position to be entirely independent. Uh, that doesn't mean to say we don't want you still to sort of listen to us because we might have some useful things to say. On this next slide, for example, we're going to look at the things that you said. So when we were asking in advance, you know, what do you want? We had a gr huge range of things, um, many of which, most of which we will touch in one way or another. Um, so you can come back to that at any point because you've got full access to that. And you could, if you want to, tick off which things we covered. But I think it's certainly our hope that we'll cover all of that. And even if we don't cover it directly in the session, if you look at the next slide that we've got, we do have this mind map of the whole session, the whole area. Um, there are links there. There are references there that you can look at. And so, again, whilst we won't cover everything, everything I think you will find will be covered in some way or another and there's some really good links and hopefully this will be a catalyst that can take you other places. So let's move on from that to our first activity because I want us to be real. In this session we'll have some people from adult community settings or from settings where you've got access to you know, one laptop and one digital projector and there'll be others who are working for university teams with you know, expert developers and all sorts. But let's take it down to the end user. If you went to your learning platform, to your VLE, what would we find? So for you to operate this, if you move the slider, the little slider bars along, I want just for you to assess from what you know of your courses or other people's courses, on your VLE, would PDFs be not very common or very common? Word documents the same and you can scroll up and down. Remember, don't do this on Ron's screen because Ron's screen isn't your screen. Just make sure you've got that learning object open up again um, and the link to the learning object, if you lost it in between times or you've only just joined, then it's in the chat pane still. So have a look at that and then uh, start filling it in. And we've got 17 people have filled in, 21, 22, it's all adding up quickly. And you'll be able to see the results. As soon as you filled it in, you can move to the next page in the Xerti object because you will then see 
um, and it will refresh as people put things in there. So uh, it's, it's very interesting uh, as it's developing at the minute. Um, quite a range. I think we might have the 40 or 50 kind of keenest people in. That wouldn't be surprising, but um, in my work, I have a look at a lot of different courses in virtual learning environments, doing accessibility snapshots for different organizations. And um, I find an awful lot of PDFs, an awful lot of Word documents, a lot of presentations, and to be frank, not a lot else. Um, the occasional quiz, yeah, web links, yes, probably, but um, okay. So that's, that's really interesting. And of course, what we want to focus on today um, is going to in part be located down in that learning objects bit. Uh, so that means that actually what we're doing may be particularly useful. So where we go from here then, there's going to be a little bit of a theme running through today because we are great believers in trying to practice what we preach. Now, that's always a dangerous thing to confess to because people then f try to find out <laughs> ways in which you failed. But um, we are trying to succeed in that. And so one of the things that we're going to be doing as you go through the learning resources, um, we're going to look at a model later on which looks at the importance of grabbing attention. So there's going to be a little bit of clickbait humour. And we've had a lot of fun doing Daily Mail style headings um, and uh, internet clickbait headings for some of the resources we're looking at. So let's look at the next one, which is Brexit won't change this. And this is a really important starting point, which we will come back to later. Um, let, we'll reflect again on this towards the end of the session. But first of all, I think it's useful for you to know that there is this new legislation um, and it applies in the EU. So Michaela, it will apply to your situation as much as in the UK. The UK has adopted it. And even though we maybe won't be part of the UK very soon, or maybe we will be for years to come at current rate, but the law still applies to us. It's been taken into UK law and it's about having accessible content. It's about showing that your content is accessible by particular dates. The dates are there and about telling students and users what it's like. So the next tab, they're lawyers. Lawyers hate you knowing about this really because online accessibility failures can be really profitable. And if Ron scrolls down a little bit just to show, just to see the graph there, that graph, the blue bits in the graph, which are start very small, 2015 and get bigger and bigger, um, those are the lawsuits, the blue bits are the lawsuits um, to do with digital accessibility compared to lawsuits to do with all other accessibility in the US. That's the trend. And on the projections of what's coming through at the moment, what's in preparation, they think that by 2019, the digital accessibility will be coming very close to maybe three quarters and above of the total number of lawsuits because digital is really easy to find um, because it's online, it's public and lawyers will actually look for, it's very easy to crawl some websites, say, okay, these ones are bad ones. Let's see if we can encourage some class actions. Surprisingly fatal though. Oh, I spelled surprisingly wrong. I'm very sorry. Because we find time and time again, there's designer death wishes in some of the resources we look at, non-selectable text, image carousels that can't be stopped or navigated by the keyboard, poor contrast designs reflecting some crazy marketing branding, which is yeah, really subtle, but nobody can read it and must have mouse design. That means I can't actually get to things unless I'm a mouse user. Do this one weird trick, just test with users. Um, have personas that you use when you're developing resources. Over to you, Ron. Okay, so along with, uh, as Alastair mentioned, the, the kind of Daily Mail type titles, we have worldwide more people own a cell phone than toothbrush. Um, this obviously is relevant to dentists, but why is it relevant to you? Um, we picked out a quote there from a, an online e-learning company. 64% of learners find accessing their learning content from a mobile device is essential. Not optional, not desirable, but essential. 
So are you using a mobile first approach to your design and creation of resources and activities? Are you testing what you create on those mobile devices? How do we even define what a mobile device is? E.g. is it a laptop, is it a tablet, is it a hybrid, smartphone, other? You, you'll all seen people walking around with phones that are bigger than tablets and tablets that are bigger, bigger than phones. And is mobile learning and mobile compatibility more about the human behavior and, and location of the learner and when and how they want to learn and the learning theory and research evidence than it is about the technology? Are these technical considerations or are they teaching and learning considerations? Who's responsible for making the choices about what tools you use and how you do things? And how does all this impact on what you do and what your learners do and use? So there's an activity question very quickly in the text chat, 30 seconds. Are you using a mo mobile first approach? And if so, how do you test the mobile compatibility of what you create? If you aren't using a mobile first approach or you're not really sure what that means, um, then just say no and or explain why you're not using that approach. So there's a very quickly in the text chat. Um, we do have 98 people here, so we won't wait for all of those responses to come through. And we've got a quick tip for everybody, if you're not aware of it, to show you how you very quickly test um, on mobile devices. Okay, so there's a, there's a lot of lows, um, hopefully a few yeses as well, but um, we'll come on to that. So the next bit is, have you tried the device emulation built into most browsers? And we've got a second page here to, and again, a clickbait headline, what your website will look like will amaze you. Um, and the tip here is, and it varies by different browser, and you'll be able to, in your own time, use the, the web link to, to try this out. But I'm just going to press F12 on my keyboard. And that's instantly switched me because I'd, I'd already um, set it to emulate a, an iPhone. And I can navigate this resource that we're using and see how that might look like on a, an iPhone. And I can change the orientation and so on. And I can also choose a number of different devices. So if I chose an iPhone X, for instance, a bigger screen and a taller screen, um, or an iPhone 6 and 7, and you can see some of them actually give you the, the kind of browser um, simulation of what that looks like. And we can navigate this resource. And you can try this on absolutely every any web page that you uh, view via your browser just by opening the developer tools. They are meant to the developers, so it can be a bit scary, um, but it's quite a neat, neat way of uh, testing what you're using against mobile devices without having to have all those mobile devices. And it's certainly different to just doing the kind of, you can see here that this isn't behaving like a mobile device. Um, just by resizing the browser, which of course is the limit of, a, of testing that a lot of people do. Um, so as I navigated that live web page, it looked like I was simulating on a web page, but I actually jumped a couple of pages. So um, that's the key tip there that you can use the, the browser console to um, test this. And there's a link there to instructions on the various browsers that you might be using. Um, so I think this is Lillian. Yeah, so uh, uh, as usual, we were using our Daily Mail uh, brains to kind of come up with a title. So this was mine. This is going to pee you off. Um, but in the last webinar, we were talking about the four P's, you know, all the different ways you could think about e-learning um, programs but we've extended our thinking uh, since then and we've added two more p's which we're not really going to talk about here um, because we're going to cover um, the psychology of um, uh, e-learning designs and then we're, and looking at the arcs model as well uh, and then we're going to go into uh, some of the things that people really want to talk about which is the production of e-learning because we're very interested in the tools and bits and pieces around that so first off we're going to look at the, the psychology or the cognitive science of um, uh, e-learning and I'm sorry this page broke your uh, demonstration Ron uh, <laughs> but um, we, we don't have a lot of time to go into the ins and outs of it but what I can say to you is that when I've been developing um, e-learning materials um, you do have to think about things at a granular level as well as a, a kind of macro level so at the, at the granular level on a particular page, you will be making decisions about how much graphic, how much text, um, and, and how you're going to get the learning points across to the learner. So 
when you're looking at something like that, these are the people, uh, mayor, clerk, sweller, etc., that you need to look at. So if you're in this field at all, I do advise you come back to this page, read some of these things, and it's just basic cognitive science. We can only look at so much, listen to so much on a particular page. So some of these key words that I found has, have kind of crept into my vocabulary are there. Um, but yeah, let's move on to the next thing, which will be about the brain-based learning. Those of you who have been with us on a few webinars will know about this. We, we started on this on the very first webinar, that everything we do needs to activate learning in the brain. And there's a very good model um, on the next page that helps us to check that this is happening. So feel free to download this. Um, but on the next page, we're going to go into the ARCS model of motivational design by John Keller. Now, this was introduced in our last webinar by Julian Tenney uh, from the University of Nottingham. Um, and, and when I was reviewing uh, some of the notes from the guest speakers, this really, really hit me as something very, very useful um, to, to kind of check off against um, your designs. So follow that link by all means after the webinar and read the blog post. Um, it, it's a very, uh, it's relatively lightweight blog post. But from there, I've taken these kind of key checklist points and, and we'll, we'll be introducing uh, our own version of the ARCS model later on in this uh, session. But the attention part of which we're, we're trying to emulate in, in this session links also very closely to uh, Ron's and my favorite uh, kind of e-learning instructional design person, Kathy Moore. So there's another link there for you to explore. But um, certainly this is well worth thinking uh, about relative to the kind of learning resources, something you might have created recently. Try testing it through with the checklist we'll introduce you to later and see how often it hits some of these uh, points, because that will help you to create something that will motivate the learner to kind of engage with you, okay? So, on this page, what we did, um, we, weren't, we weren't sure we were gonna be able to squeeze all the guest speakers in. So what I've done here is I've, I've uh, had an uh, online meeting with Adam Pico from Sheffield University, and he's talked through how he's applied um, the ARCS model to Grammar Guru. This is something that he's created, and it's linked from um, the Padlet um, that we'll show you later. So. What he's done is he's taken each point and thought through his design. And in so doing, he's picked up a couple of points that he can kind of put towards like the next iteration of the design. Um, he's had some very good feedback from learners on it. Um, so, you know, things like that help him to kind of improve the design. And what he said is that now that he's come across it, he will definitely use it to guide his future designs as well. So hopefully you'll benefit from this. Um, do watch it after, it's about 10 minutes. Um, and then we move on to how did they make that? And that's Ron's favorite topic. So I'm going to let him take over. I'm not sure about that, Lillian. I'll put a direct link into the text chat for this little interaction as well. Um, what we'd like you to do just very quickly is um, you can drag these, not on my screen, but on your own copy, you can drag these um, items to the to the screen so that you can see what they all are and then rearrange them to, um, so I suspect, I'm not giving anything away here, I suspect you will all know that um, actually that's not the right one. And Identifying the need, I would argue, is the first step. So just have a very quick go at that interaction and then when you've got them, in what you think is the right order, click the check response um, button and perhaps just put in the text chat a yes when you've when you've completed that interaction. Um, it's not a serious thing, it's just uh, we want to make a couple of points about that. Um, so just very quickly interact with it in your own copy, not on my screen, and, um, and let us know in the text chat when you've done that. And there is a point I'll make about that particular resource is that it's an accessible drag and drop. You can do it uh, without using the mouse at all. You can tab through, select with the space bar, tab to the target, and, and then drop it with the space bar again. So maybe I'll demonstrate that, Alistair. So yeah, if I yeah. tab to the share and reuse button there, I'll hit the space bar and 
let's say I want to actually put that in step six, I hit space bar again, and it's put that into that position. Um, and that's a good test actually with any output from any tool. Um, if you try that kind of interaction with keyboard alone and force yourself not to use a mouse, then you're putting yourself in the position of um, someone that actually is forced to use the keyboard only. Um, so let's have a go at getting this um, right. I think probably uh, there, publicize it to users. Uh, and Twan's made a good point there about how does the user find out about the keyboard interaction. I think one of the things that will be really useful when you're creating resources like this, um, depending on the context and how you're doing it, but you will want to have some sort of accessibility information. And uh, one of the things that I've got on some of the resources I've created for sessions is a, just a little page that says, what you're gonna, if, you know, for using this user advice, we haven't actually added it into this. It would make uh, an even longer page, but it's a good point, Antoine. I think we can do that for future ones. A couple of people have said they can't drag anything, Alistair. I suspect, um, maybe I'm wrong, that you're look, trying to do that on my screen um, rather than the own co your own copy. So I put the link back in the text chat direct to that, and you should be able to then interact with it. And what you might want to do is just you know, resize the window so that you've got both copies open, both your own copy of the learning resource plus my screen sharing to show you what you're looking at. Um, quite a few people have said they've they've completed the accessibility uh, the, the activity now, and what we wondered about. Um, okay, uh, one of my colleagues has added a, a further little point there, so I'll let you pick up on that. Whoever um, did that, but one of the questions we had. Um, and actually, this is strange because uh, we had a question about where would you, we've mentioned the ARCS model and the, the framework. At what step would you consider that? At what point would you be referring to any kind of framework, whether it's the ARCS model or, or any other kind of learning design framework and guidance? At what step do you um, need to be considering that? Is it at the beginning, right at the outset, or at the end, or midway through, or all of those steps? Um, and a few people were commenting on the getting different steps the wrong way around. Of course, this isn't a valid right or wrong thing anyway. And in fact, if you um, watch the way myself, Alistair and Lillian work on producing these resources, um, we probably do this cycle of seven steps, you know, very many times. And, and we've been updating this resource um, right until the last minute. And Alastair Lillian, did you add the comment here about peer review? And do you want to add something about that before we move on? Not me. Must be Alistair. I, I'd say mm -hmm. that our our way of working isn't so much steps as a spiral <laughs> mesh. Honestly, <laughs> spiral <laughs> mesh even, yeah. <laughs> well, no, I think it's a spiral mesh and I think it works because we weave in and out each other's ideas and each one feeds the other person. So although I didn't put that there, this peer review thing is a very valid one. Um, is this something you put in uh, ages ago, uh, Ron? Maybe it might be. <laughs> maybe I've got my copies of all my You need to have a word with yourself. But yes, <laughs> this is a very good point. Test it out on a colleague who hasn't seen your project. You know, that's a first step before you expose it to students who might see glaring errors that your colleague can pick up quite easily. And I think the other thing that's really helpful, we got a, a classic example later on in this session, is that when you have discussions uh, with colleagues, when you say, try this out, see if it works for you um, each of us sees completely different things because each of us has a different set of internal priorities and we were having a, a discussion yesterday about a resource that, that we'll show later and and Lillian was haranguing me about the accessibility which is great it's you know slight irony it was that way around but it was great and she was absolutely right but I was so focused on what the pedagogy was that I, I wasn't taking enough account of the, um, the accessibility elements and it was only because I was having that, you know, that, um, that discussion that I thought, you know what, she's absolutely right. There are better ways, even pedagogically, that this could be done that would be better for accessibility and wouldn't lose the pedagogical value added. So I think 
being able to talk with people, share with people, uh, is really helpful part of the stage. But which stage it comes in at is you know, very debatable. And it's just, a, sorry, just one last point. I think several people have said, you know, um, lots of other things might come in at the start. And we absolutely agree with you. And I think that's the point of it. Starting off with your philosophy in the first place in this whole thing depending on what your philosophy is, it's going to impact on all your processes and your steps and all the other things that you're going to consider. EA's made the point about checking copyright of images and IP, and that is a really good point, EA. Um, I don't think we'd added it there because we tend, you know, we're tending to kind of assume that that was somebody working on their own, using their own resources. But of course, in reality, people will be taking resources that perhaps other people have, have fed to them. It's a really good point, EA. I've had some terrible problems where I've created a resource based on somebody's teaching materials, and then I found, it that, all, found that all the images were completely copyright protected, and I couldn't have used any of them. So. I think I'd, I'd add to that as well, that there's very different rules and licensing uh, for the ability to share in an end product and the sharing for repurposing. And we, we have that debate on this project quite a lot because everything we use, we want to make available for not only reconsumption and reuse, but actually repurposing so that you can download the resources and edit them and make use of them. And that's a kind of different requirement um, copyright wise to just being able to share the resources online for people to consume um, we've moved on because we are tight for time as we've said so you can <clears> come back to all of these things and we will pick up anything in the text chat that we missed towards the end if we've got some spare time and on on that note what we decided is that we uh, again catchy headline we're refusing to reinvent the wheel so if you're new to these future teacher talks We've done completely separate talks, hour-long talks, and, and much longer resources on the topic of rich media. So we've covered rich media and use of images. We've covered rich media and use of audio, rich media and use of video. And also our very last talk, a previous talk to this one, was on designing for technology-enhanced programs. And as Lillian mentioned, um, the ARCS model came up from our, one of our guest presenters in that, Julian Tenney. And so we're not reinventing the wheel. We're not repeating all of that here. The resources, the recording, and everything else is all available to you freely um, via our resource. And so you can revisit that. And so if you're here today in particular interest in those kind of rich, rich media creation and collation aspects of designing resources and producing resources, that's all there in those previous sessions. And continuing the catchy clickbait theme, one of the things we're aware of is that there may well be within the 101 people on this session at the moment, there may well be people who are thinking, oh my goodness, I haven't got access to all these different things or I haven't got technical skills. And we, we want to say that actually very small things can be really make big differences and what's fundamental is the pedagogy you can be good on pedagogy but poor on technology and use very simple skills to create really good materials um, and storytelling is often a part of that i talked here here's the heading post truth e-learning but we're talking about not not post truth but about taking something that is pure fact and turning it into narrative into mystery into characters and different bits of the brain add up when you tell something as a story than if you simply recount it as facts and the so here's a story we're going to we've based a very simple version of all these different frameworks euro bears bother blonde it is of course the goldilocks story and this is a model that um, a very simple model, really, just to, for people that haven't got the, the time, haven't got the, the background to be able to do all the other frameworks and just think, OK, well, what, what's the utter basic that I need to look at? And I've called this the Goldilocks model, because if you take this sense of what engages people, well, is, is the activity engaging? What are they doing? Is it making notes or actually something creative and collaborative? And what are they doing it with? You know, is it just text or is it a mixture of text and graphic? or rich media and text and graphic um, and then you took take the ease of use as a third um, title you get these options something could be too monotonous too frustrating too passive or just right because it's got a mix of all of those and so you can scroll down and, and look at more of the detail on that um, but the, that third tab at the top there 
um, is this is a really simple thing for you to be able to just uh, sketch out those three axes very quickly on any resource you're looking at before you go into all the, the big scale storyboarding that, that sometimes if you're a time pressure teacher you think I haven't got time to do all of this and all of that okay well sketch those three axes where does your resource plot that will tell you how you might improve it so on the next slide we have um, a brilliant resource, brilliant set of resources. Thank you very much to people that contributed to this. But um, I won't go through any of these in any detail at the moment because I think these are for you to come back to and have a look at. But it gives you a sense of what range of great resources are out there. Now, I say great resources, but of course, when we come back to the ARCS model and the scary model that we're going to develop from the ARCS model, um, there may be some of these where you say, well, this is great for this, and I can see exactly why it's been recommended, but it's awful if you're trying to use it without a mouse, for example. And so, and we will come back to that because there are some very important um, issues for us to consider and some important compromises for us to make sometimes and we've got lo legal things hanging around this so we need to know exactly where we stand and exactly how we might justify something that is partially accessible now starting um, taking that point of low tech you know what can you do if you've got very little it isn't the tool, it's, as we said before, it's about the pedagogy, what you do. There's a couple of examples here just to show some very low-tech stuff on Office. So the first one is the original. Um, this was taken from a history teacher and had an exam question attached to it. It was very hard for students to do, particularly some students. The development of that was a kind of interactive one with uh, where the pedagogy had um, gone forward uh, as had the um, the actual activity what you were doing and you can download that and have a look at that the instructions are there but it was impossible to use um, without being a mouse user so after being appropriately castigated by my dear Lillian friend um, we had a look at well okay how could you do this let's look at this as a Google Doc um, where you might use comments and put things in or where you might those movable text boxes could be done a different way. Now each of those three different approaches had benefits of some sort and disbenefits barriers of others and so again in your own time come back look at those. The PowerPoint is again just a really simple way of using PowerPoint in a completely different way. So in this case instead of giving people the PowerPoint and so much of the time when I look at um, VLE courses in colleges and universities, I see loads of PowerPoints and some of them are fantastic. They are just really creative, really interesting, really well put together. But I think, why was that creative process stolen from the students? Because if you'd given the framework of the PowerPoints and all the images you're going to put in there, bundle them together at the end, um, and all the text perhaps have, a, have some references, some links, and say to the student, no, you have to present, you have to create the presentation. Then suddenly they are not becoming a passive consumer, they are becoming an active creator. And a little thing like that can make a difference. And then if you're into Excel, for example, um, and here's our, one of our Excel examples that I used to use with my students. Um, Excel has got some fantastic functionality. Now, if you don't use Excel, you won't like this at all. But if you do use Excel, then um, being able to take just a couple of slider bars and change the slider bars, and depending on where you were, um, so I've got an image there of a, a bit of woodland. It was a bit of field work where we looked at microclimate. And the trouble with microclimate is it only works in certain days certain weathers if you've got a, a force four or five wind blowing and it's a grey drizzly day you won't find any microclimate change across the woodland so we, we were often in that situation so I needed something that they could explore on their own and basically just put together the typical data that you would find across a section across section like that and had some lookup tables and then depending on where you move that that little pointer you can you 
get different information plotting on the graph and different background ideas that you can search for and pop up. It was a really simple, well, it wasn't simple if you don't use Excel, but for an Excel user with a few functionalities, uh, a bit of confidence with some simple formulae, it was quite straightforward to put together and gave students enormous um, opportunities to be creative and to do things, to explore things in their own way in their own time. And this is over to Ron. Sorry, Alastair, Lillian and I don't have the bell that you have, so we couldn't ring. <laughs> but... I put a virtual one on the chat. <laughs> um, sorry, sorry, I didn't see that. I thought I was, I was looking at the wrong line on the spreadsheet. <laughs> um, my erstwhile colleagues mentioned that you can tell that I put this page together because there's so much text alongside each one. And, and that's deliberate because we want this resource to be uh, useful for you when you access it in your own time after the webinar and so we've added quite a bit of context here to explain these examples that we put in um, and so you can navigate these in your own time we certainly don't have time particularly after Alistair overrunning to, <laughs> I'm sorry. to navigate these in, in any detail um, the one I did want to very quickly um, open up is a resource and a presentation that I gave at a previous Xerti conference. We made no excuses um, kind of promoting and presenting uh, Xerti because we use that for these projects for all sorts of benefits, including accessibility. And there's a, a full blown um, session recording there that's linked to as well. Um, but one of the main points that I'm always aware of, and I'll quickly navigate to um, the main page of this, is the whole thing about um, roles and and different authoring tools many organizations if you're lucky enough will have a team of developers a team of learning technologists and that's great and they can create some fantastic stuff and we're going to see an example of that shortly from by Owen from um, Cardiff um, but actually in terms of tools you need to be thinking about the the tools that everybody can use the 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 kind of the easy to use tools that enable and empower everybody because then you can make far more effective use of your own specialist skills. And so there's a, there's a range of pop-ups here that have multi navigation um, notes about considerations when you're choosing what offering tool to use. And the main point there is to consider um, everybody in your organization, not just your specific role. If you have a, if you have a role that's about creating resources, I would argue, we would argue that that's far better time spent if you're doing the stuff that really values your skills and expertise and that you allow um, everybody else to use perhaps even the same tool in some cases to create their own content too. We have a range of resources here. So um, we have links to previous resources that we've shared via the, the different sessions. And Lillian already mentioned Kathy Moore. There's a prompt here about if you are creating very kind of click next linear navigation, um, there's some really simple and effective tips that Kathy provides on how to make that engaging. And there's some great examples from the University of Nottingham that are all basically fairly straightforward in terms of text and images and perhaps the odd video and a little interaction and so on. But the real value and the real engagement is the problem solving uh, approach that they've been developed with. And, and again, there's a recording link there that's a full blown presentation about that approach and how effective it has been with learners. So I'm not going to go through all of these. There's lots of examples. Someone mentioned copyright earlier on. There's some uh, a just legal example here, a couple of them um, that are all about copyright. They are a bit old now, but they're freely available, including uh, links to download them. And there's some nice kind of uh, picking up the Goldilocks theme. There's a nice little demonstration of nonlinear navigation uh, with a Goldilocks story there from Faye. And again, another recorded presentation. So lots of resources for you to re return to. We did also have this question about, you know, do you deliver? Because in the workflow, you do need to consider um, how you deliver and how you make your resources available and how you track that learning. And again, I'm, I'm just going to quickly mention that these tabs are here and talking about um, the jargon terms like SCORM and LTI and XAPI, really the guidance that we've only got time to say now is speak to your learning technologies team or whoever is responsible for all of that if you need advice about that kind of thing. Um, so at this point, I'm going to unusually be able to stop sharing my screen and hand over to Owen Crawford from the University of Cardiff, who's going to show an excellent uh, 
way that they've been using Xerti and other techniques at the university. Thanks, Ron. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now for a second. Um, and I believe there's a link to this on the um, Xerti project as well. Um, we all okay? Can we all see that? Yep. Bro. Great. So um, I, I believe I've got about six minutes. So what I'm going to do is um, just talk very quickly through something that we did where we looked at um, leveraging the advantages of different tools um, to create an interactive uh, virtual 360 environment. Um, so we, we do some work with students as well when they create their environments, as Ron was, um, when they create resources in the same way that Ron was just saying, where we look at what tools do you use and what the advantages are for those tools and why you should, why you should choose what, what you choose. Um, and as part of this, we thought a lot about what tool we'll use to create this environment. Um, so I don't know if anyone's, uh, linked to a medical school or anything, but this is, um, a dental clinic. And one of the assessments that our students have to do is, uh, go from station to station in the clinic and answer a question, uh, demonstrate a technique or talk about something in each station. And it's generally one of the most scary exams that people do. And it gets to the point sometimes where actually they're so nervous that they can't follow instructions like how to navigate around the room or where to go next or how long to wait outside the door for um, in when there's, when there's actually doors. Um, and we wanted to create something to kind of help with that anxiety, but also to allow them the opportunity to practice uh, and prepare for these um, questions. So we built this environment um, in an open source tool. I'll talk a little bit about that earlier, uh, later, sorry. And what it allows people to do is to be part of the simulation and move around the different stations. And then for each station, they get to open up an example of good practice. I don't know if you'll be able to see this video through the screen share, but there's a video here of good practice of how to clean a station. And then they get the option to describe in this case, how they would do it and get feedback. And then the, and there's some more information about this if they want to learn a bit further. And then they also get the option to look at this video here, which is kind of an average practice and use the mark sheet that they'll be marked on to mark against this um, demonstration of average practice. So it kind of brings a few things together for like seeing the exemplars, um, understanding how you're going to be marked. And then the sort of the less obvious side of it is the reducing anxiety, getting used to the environment, understanding how you'll move around the stations and what sort of things you might be asked. Um, in terms of technology, so this, 360 environment is built in a tool called Marzipano, which is an open source tool um, that allows you to put hotspots onto 360 images. We use a sort of fairly basic 360 camera to jet take the images. Um, sorry, if, so if anyone's in the chat asking me anything, I can't actually see the chat because I haven't got a chat box on screen, but I'll have a look in it after, after I'm done. Um, and then so we actually, the pop-ups on here are all Xerties with the header that you'd normally see and taken off, the footer turned into a flat sort of screen. Um, and what's brilliant about this is that um, when we're talking about who creates things, not using people with specific skills to create basic things, um, is that actually these Xerti projects can be created, updated and managed by anyone in the team um, and the people that actually know the content that's gonna go into these, these answers. Um, rather than having to sort of code this into a big 360 environment as a separate tool. It also means that we can use XAPI within these embeds to track what people are doing, what people are looking at, what their answer feedback is, and sort of get a bit more of an idea about what they're doing. Um, so what really happens when we create these is that uh, originally I, I would create the 360 environment put the hotspots in and people would then create the Xerties to go along with it. And I would embed those. But now we've moved on to the point where actually we've got our staff creating 360 environments using Marzipano to put the hotspots in and then sending it over to me. And I'm just adding a couple of lines of code to create these buttons that you can see on here and doing a little bit of styling. 
Um, because yeah, with a front end editor with Marzi Pano, you get this entire thing apart from these buttons. So it's really straightforward to put something together. Um, yeah, and I add mm, seven or eight lines of code to get these interactions to come up, and that's about it. Um, we've also found got examples of using these sort of environments in the classroom as well as online. So um, people get to have a look at uh, what our example is a waiting room um, where you've got five people and you've got to decide which one of them you would deal with first. So they get to stand in the waiting room and look around, um, tap on people, find out more information about them, speak to them, watch videos about them. And they can do that in lecture theatres in small groups uh, using iPads. Um, is that one, one minute? One minute, one minute. Okay, yeah. bro, I'm literally one minute to go. You're brilliant. Um, they, we've also used it as a way of capturing um, environments such as people's homes and then passing it to occupational therapy students so they can look at someone's house and say, right, this is, hotspot is where I would do this. Um, this hotspot is where I can do that. And you can give them a 360 environment with the Zertian to give them instructions about it. And then you can give them a blank one where they can discuss. Um, we've also used it for keeping in touch days to show prospective students that are offer holders around the university and for inductions as well. Uh, I think in summary, one sentence, this has all been about le choosing the appropriate tool at the appropriate level of um, who needs to use it and leveraging the advantage of Xerti for the community updating, the responsiveness, the ease of use, and then Marzipano for the open source, again, really straightforward to use, but then combining them together into something that is more than either of them can do individually. Mm. Is that okay, Ron? That's great, um, Owen. And, you know, um, you and I both know that actually this has become, 360 technology has become so accessible for, for anyone kind of watching this and thinking it's, it's kind of way too technical and way too difficult to achieve. Actually, 360 cameras are available for less than £100 these days. And um, as I've mentioned in the text chat, tools like H5P give you this kind of editing environment as well. Um, and it's really about the creativity and the application. Um, and we're going to come on to some topics um, from the ARCS model or our revived scary model that really taps into what's the value behind this, the, the relevance and so on, and the real world situation. I need to share my screen again. That's great, Owen. Thanks very much for that. No problem. Um, I think there's plenty of people wanting to ask questions as well on that. So if we can continue the questions on the GISMAIL um, list, the future teacher list, that would be fantastic uh, because there's loads there of really good quality practice that I think people would like to know more about. Um, we just want to go a little bit beyond. If you look, check Alice. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, Are you seeing the? Yep, I'm the seeing the screen. I need. Yep. Right. Uh, so if you were to, um, if you were to forensically analyze what Owen's been doing, I think you'd find a lot of arcs in there, the arcs model, the uh, getting the attention and so on, and um, the relevance, the confidence, the satisfaction, etc. All of that's built into it. But what we've been doing is we've been taking the arcs model and because of the legislation that's coming in, there's an extra bit, there's an I in there now as well. So it's kind of arcs with an eye, the inclusion at the end. And um, just kind of re-scramble it a little bit to give you scary. And the point is that it's scary because accessibility has often been left to disability support staff, but actually accessibility belongs to everyone. And there's some fantastic links there on making your service accessible, helping teams understand what they need. And that, that one down the bottom from the US has got very specific role-based guidance for different people in the team. And then the last um, element there is uh, something, again, for you to go and have a look at if you want to explore this further. There's something that we used in a previous uh, Zerti, uh, sorry, a previous future teacher session where we took the same text resource and we created it in lots of different formats. Uh, Articulate, Zerti, Word, PowerPoint, uh, sorry, Word, um, yes, PowerPoint, PDF, etc. And then we gave you some things to look for in terms of its accessibility. And this, this is what it looks like and it's got instructions on there. Then you can download or go to all the individual elements of it and look at which of those formats would be more accessible for which purposes. We've also given you, this is something Ron's done, a little bit of magic that Ron's done on the next thing here. If you wanted to take that ARCS model and look at the revamped SCARY model, 
any material that you're currently working on or that you're about to start working on, there's a checklist here that you can fill in on here, uh, on this page, put your notes in and uh, click the download button at the bottom. And that's something for you to work with as a tool, hopefully that will be useful for your teams. And that's exactly what Kathleen was asking about whether the typing on the um, e-learning could be downloaded. And Kathleen, this is a page that you can try um, for yourself uh, just to see what happens. Um, so yes, you can build pages like that for yourself where the learner can actually do some input and actually take something away with them, especially if it's action planning related. Um, so uh, yeah, so I, I'm not sure if um, uh, Alistair kind of uh, reinforced this idea that uh, the SCAR is, is, is arcs turned back to front. And we've added the I for the inclusiveness because we feel that that really adds to the kind of model um, that we were explaining earlier. And it's our intention to kind of turn this into a bit more of an infographic that you might be able to download, share with colleagues, etc. So do join us on the JISC mail um, future teacher list because that's where we'll make an announcement about that. Um, okay, so Lillian, just one quick thing about the completion of this um, to download. I've put a little note in there that actually you can come back to this and complete, but as soon as you close the learning object window, those any entries will be lost. So do any if you do fill in the form, make sure you click and download a copy, but then you can come back and start again from scratch if you want to use the form for a, another resource that you're <laughs> comparing and so on. Okay, that's very good to know. Okay, so, you know, we, we've done a very much a whistle-stop tour of some of the things that you kind of need to be f become familiar with. Um, and this is part of an ongoing journey. This is just one little uh, uh, stepping stone, if you like, in, in a massive journey uh, to do with, like, developing, uh, you know, learning technology awareness, pedagogy awareness, etc. So this is all part of our DigiComp framework, which looks like a nice suite, in my opinion. Um, if you've not come across it yet, do come back and visit it. It uh, maps very nicely to UKPSF uh, and you can kind of use this as a way to discuss with colleagues their development uh, and their long-term goals in terms of digital skills as well. Um, and moving on to our journeys. Um, so what we'd like to do is to invite you to start coming on our journeys on our EU platform, if you like. This is the, this is the um, European uh, project. Um, and as um, Alistair hinted earlier, Brexit doesn't affect anything. We're still kind of working with our partners to kind of improve the digital uh, teaching skills of, of colleagues uh, in Europe and in the UK. So work through these steps and this will get you into a different learning environment. We all know Blackboard, we all know Moodle, um, so it's quite nice to just step outside and consider a different model of learning management system. So do, do join us in this um, and we, we invite you to kind of try our flipped classroom journey uh, and uh, online learning journey and to, and to give us some feedback and, and let us know what you think about the journey. So that's the link to the Google form on step 11 for that. And uh, we've been talking a little bit about our GISC mail list. Um, when we finish this, we'll be launching, or, or Alistair, have you added a, a thread already to our GISC mail list? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay, so after this, what we'll do is we'll add this thread to our just mail list. Do do go on there, and, and I'm sure Owen um, will will answer questions on there as well about what he used um, uh, to create his uh, uh, 360 experience. Um, but what we'd like you to join in is, is, is coming together to kind of collect the kind of support network um, sources, anything to do with building or designing e-learning. Um, um, Ron and I, you know, use e-learning heroes quite a lot, even though it's articulate storyline. There's a lot of um, very usable uh, ideas from there. So we'll go into the just mail list and we'll be adding those links in there. So do join us in the just mail list. I think it's Ron. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, over to Ron. I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, 
we always have these screens at the end. Um, we have one last activity for those of you who are still around to um, reflect in the text chat. But um, our next webinar is, in, is on actually designing and running webinars. And we think we've got um, over the last couple of years quite a few um, tips and tricks that we've developed to, to share and discuss with you about that. If anyone is very keen to share their own experience of running webinars, we'd like to hear from you. Um, and just like Owen um, did a guest seat speaker slot today, um, we'd, we'd encourage somebody to, or, or anyone that's interested to contact us and discuss that. Um, between now and the next talk, we'd like you to, as Lillian just mentioned, carry on sharing your thoughts and discussions and reflections via the just mail list or via Twitter, if you're a, a fan of social media um, and so on. So what one thing will you do as a result of the text chat? So we normally um, stay a little bit longer here and have an informal chat and respond to any questions that haven't been answered in the text chat. But before you leave, please share with us what one thing will you do as a result of what we've discussed? Um, be as specific as you can rather than um, it was a great session. I'll review the resources, try and pick out something particularly that you all do and take as an action from what we've covered today. And then it will go silent as we're not talking. So Alistair and Lillian kind of have, uh, have you picked up any text chat comments? Oh, I, want, I want to, yeah, I was giving people a chance to, um, to write without, noise in their ears <laughs> i would just want to say thank you to adam who's who's in our um participants list as well i'm sorry we didn't get to uh turn the mic in your direction but as you can see <laughs> we're, we're literally very tight for time but uh hopefully people can continue to use the gist mail list for discussions some really good things coming in there. Um, very broad range as well. Somebody testing for, with mobile devices. So I think Ron's uh, little bit on you know how to emulate that in the browser is uh, incredibly useful. I found that very helpful when I saw that magic. Oh, Fran, that's really, really good. We, we always encourage everyone who's been to try and bring someone else to join in next time. So, you know, that we kind of spread the word and expand the number of people who can join us um, and, and not forgetting you can go, go and look through our back catalog of webinar recordings and resources as well so michael's on about exporting xerti come into the community on, on xerti community and, and and discuss uh what you intend to do michael uh, we've got antoine and paul going to be applying the uh, the revised arcs model the scary model uh, into their simulations. Paul, this is a really interesting one there because I think when you look at some simulations like um, Owen's work, um, there is a, it's absolutely clear that if I was a screen reader user, there's no way that I would be able to know what that was showing me. Does that mean that you can't, you know, with the new legislation, you can't use that model? No, it doesn't mean that at all, because obviously what has been created is adding fantastic value to a lot of students, including a lot of disabled students. But because of reasons that are beyond coding, reasons that are cognitive reasons, that specific resource wouldn't work with a screen reader user. That is not a problem. What is a problem is if nobody knows but if a screen reader user doesn't know that that resource won't be accessible and they don't know what their alternative should be. What would, and that's where the accessibility statement, which again, if you look back at the notes, that's in there, the accessibility statement becomes really important at stopping uh, students with disabilities wasting time trying to do something that you know from the start won't work for their particular assistive technology. So. Um, Owen's example and the examples you're working on may be absolutely brilliant, but if you know they're not going to work with a blind student, then you just need to know what and um, how you tell the relevant audience that it won't work. And secondly, what alternative would they have? And that's probably fairly straightforward. Um, in Owen's case, it would be, well, if we had a blind student um, in this environment, we would take them around the individual booths we would navigate them around or whatever um, although you you may if it was dentistry um you know you, you might be doing a different kind of assessment because you might not have a blind dentist but you could definitely have a blind dental researcher so um hopefully 
we've been really encouraged with our work with government digital services who are developing the guidance on this because they are really understanding that some things um, you know are not going to be um, totally accessible to everybody and it's just how you manage that so that nobody ends up just being left out in the cold or wasting time is important okay um EA, do you want to turn your mic on and have a chat? And I think we're kind of, um, oh, Ron, have we finished um, recording? I can stop the recording now, although we often get some very useful um, yeah. discussion after that. So okay. what do we think? Should we leave it running or stop? Yeah, leave it running and people can, can stop if they've had enough. But um, uh, I noticed Robert's on the other side of the Atlantic, so yeah. spreading the work there. So it looks like we span the Atlantic and we go as far as Austria in the other direction. So... Uh, great to have you all in here. Okay. Bank catalogue. Uh, have we given the link to the bank? Yeah, we put the link. Yes, we in. Have. Um, shall we get EA in on the discussion as well? She had some something to add. And and Owen, if you've got anything Anyone. to add, particularly Any um, the the arcs model that we've introduced and and how much of that um, is relevant to what you're doing. <laughs> I was just going to say we had a fantastic evening last night up in London with Microsoft and um, accessibility and AI and it's become a subject that I'm deep into at the moment because of a project that I have for a year with the Alan Turing Institute and one of the interesting things was that Saquib um, who's a blind Microsoft developer who did the Seeing AI app was showing how he was using it live with some of the videos that they were showing um, and managing to capture some of the content and then he was rolling his finger over the image having captured that uh, section and it was reading back to him exactly what was on the image. It was very impressive. The recognition has improved wholesale recently and there's huge sort of steps in the right direction. That doesn't mean that what you were, you were saying wasn't absolutely right, Alistair. It was just that there are some fun things happening now that actually um, someone like Sarkoe really ought to come and explain to you just to make teachers feel less concerned about the fact that they are using video or they are using imagery because um, some, some of the assistive technology or assistive, I should say assistive um, artificial intelligence is cracking some, okay, nuts that we didn't think we could crack before. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. I've seen some of the um, Microsoft AI um, mm. at work, but I've not seen it at that, that level. Well, it's, um, it's very beta. It's just, we really yeah. are just, I don't know, just at such a cusp at the moment because yeah. of the lack of data that one has to keep feeding it data. And of course, there's not enough data. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just worth cheering people up in a way. I felt very cheered by it because he was just standing there and saying, look, I can do this now. This is just so great. Come on, we've got to embrace it because we hear so many negative things going on about the latest uh, technologies. But actually, it was exciting. Yeah, that sounds brilliant. For everybody that in the text chat has said that they're going to revisit Xerti, we, we were hoping to launch the new Xerti website in time for this session, but time has escaped us. So watch out for that with a lot of uh, new resources and uh, new info. Um, hopefully it won't be too long. Okay. Ron, can I, uh, can I off call or whatever it is, ask you about my Serbo Croatian -Croat problem? <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to stop the recording now so that we can kind of talk about things that are not relevant to future teacher projects. So um, I'll do that now.